In this module, we'll look at the many different types of lift trucks being used in the pulp and paper industry and the various tasks they perform. And we'll examine why specific areas of use are determined by the special design features of each lift truck. Lift trucks come in many shapes and sizes, the most common being the forklift. These versatile machines can be used to do just about any type of material handling. For instance, recycled paper has now become a big part of paper making. As waste bales arrive from recycling stations, forklifts are used to offload raw materials and stack them for reprocessing. Forklifts can be found separating inventory and moving practically any type of material from one place to another in a paper mill. And when the finished products come off the line, ready for the customer, you'll find forklifts busy at work in the shipping area, loading them into waiting transport trucks. In fact, the forklift is such a useful machine, it's hard to imagine how work could ever get done without it. But a forklift can also be very dangerous if proper care isn't taken by its operator. You take these two pointed steel forks in the front of the vehicle, for example. They're what distinguish this lift truck from all the others. They allow the truck to lift and support loads, but they can also pose a very serious safety hazard. Once the truck is moving, these forks are powerful enough to cut through a cement wall or a steel I-beam. It may surprise you to know that a forklift can weigh four times as much as your average car. That's mainly because of the heavy counterweight at the rear of the vehicle to offset the load on the front. Add a heavy load to the forks and you've got a vehicle that's very difficult to stop because of weight and momentum. Sure, it's versatile and makes your job a lot easier, but be careful. In a split second, a forklift can kill or seriously injure you or anyone else that gets in the way. Another reason why lift trucks are so versatile are the attachments that can be fitted to the front of the vehicle. These are designed to meet specific needs, such as removing paper roll cores. The horn is another example of how a lift truck can be modified to perform other tasks. The simple post attachment at the front of the machine now allows the lift truck to pick up and transport smaller butt rolls of paper. The other common type of lift truck you'll find in the pulp and paper industry is the clamp truck. It's really not that much different from a forklift except for the articulating clamps on the front of the machine. The short arm and the long arm of the clamps are used to grip, lift, and move paper rolls. These powerful units can pick up paper rolls weighing in excess of 3,000 pounds and move them with ease. There are two ways a clamp truck is used to pick up paper rolls. The first is to rotate the clamp and carefully pick up the paper roll in the vertical position. And the second way is the horizontal or bilge position. With the short arm of the clamp tilted downward, the operator eases the truck forward, clamps the roll, and raises it. The roll is then rotated to the vertical position before moving. This ensures that the load is stable and no undue stress is placed on the short clamp arm. But more important, it prevents the danger of a runaway roll if the load is accidentally dropped. Some amount of manual materials handling is always necessary in a plant or mill. One type of lift truck used to minimize the risk of injury is the low lift pallet. These lift trucks are equipped with wheel forks designed to fit between the top and bottom boards of double face pallets or getting under the bottom of a pallet in order to lift up a load. Once the forks are under the pallet, the wheels are lowered. This lifts the forks and raises the load approximately six inches off the floor. There are two basic types of low lift pallet trucks, the ride-on and the walkie. The walkie is controlled by the operator on foot, while the ride-on has a platform for the operator to stand. This allows you to ride the truck as you maneuver through the mill. Another difference between these two pallet trucks are their braking systems. The Waki unit has abrupt stop brakes, which let the operator stop the vehicle very quickly if necessary. The brakes are applied when the control arm is either in the fully raised or fully lowered position. The brakes on the ride-on pallet truck are called cushion-style brakes. 
This prevents the operator from being thrown off the platform if he breaks suddenly. Skid steer loaders are another kind of lift truck you'll find in most paper mills. These units are used mostly for cleanup work, like picking up scrap paper from underneath a winder or paper machine and moving it back to stock prep. Bucket jaws are usually attached to the front of the loader's bucket if paper is being moved. This lets you pick up scrap paper more easily. Vehicle rollover is a major safety concern with skid steer operators because of the compact design and quick maneuverability of these vehicles. The cabs in skid steer loaders are equipped with seat belts and a seat bar to secure the operator safely in place. A unique lift truck designed to move workers and materials is the scissor lift work platform. They come equipped with a protected working platform and hinged lifting scissors. This allows maintenance people to conduct inspections at elevated working heights. These mobile units are used almost exclusively for installation, maintenance, and repair work. Another way in which work can be conducted at elevated areas in the mill is with the use of a personnel carrier attachment. These units are fitted onto the forks and carriage of the forklift and permit maintenance workers to safely reach high areas near the ceiling. This allows them to do inspections or make repairs while the operator remains at the controls of the lift truck. These are only a few of the many varieties of lift trucks and special attachments that are found not only in the pulp and paper sector, but the entire resource industry. The type of truck you select will depend on a number of things, such as the weight, size, and shape of the load to be moved, the load capacity of the truck, and the conditions of the work environment. When considering the work environment as it relates to truck selection, a matter of critical concern is fire safety. All industrial lift trucks are required by law to conform to specific fire safety specifications. This is indicated by the manufacturer with a letter designation found on the capacity data plate of the lift truck. Type designations indicate the power source of the lift truck. They also indicate that muffler, exhaust system, backfire, spark emission, fuel pump explosion, and electrical switch tests have been conducted in the laboratory. This ensures that the design of the lift truck is safe to use in specific atmospheres. All type designations beginning with the letter D refer to diesel-powered lift trucks. Most diesel-powered lift trucks are classified with a single letter D meaning they have the minimal acceptable safeguards against inherent fire hazards. Designations beginning with the letter E refer to electric powered units. G is for gasoline and LP indicates liquefied petroleum gas, the most common being propane. The type designation will limit the truck's use to specific areas. As an operator, you must know exactly where your lift truck can or cannot go. For instance, Using a diesel or gasoline powered truck inside would quickly contaminate the air with exhaust fumes and deadly carbon monoxide. A chlorine dioxide plant is another example of how a workplace dictates which lift truck type is safe to use. Here, flammable gases are handled in closed systems and containers. Only electric powered lift trucks with special motor enclosures or diesel units with temperature limitation features are recommended. In all, 13 different type designations exist for industrial lift trucks in order to safeguard against fires and explosions. The work location and the nature of potential hazards will dictate which type is appropriate. Remember, it's not as simple as just jumping on a lift truck and driving anywhere in the mill. Each lift truck is designed for specific areas of use. And it's your responsibility as an operator to know what those specific areas are. Lift trucks are very different from your own car or truck in several important ways. 
One of the key differences is the way the lift truck is balanced. This places strict limitations on the vehicle when it comes to lifting or moving loads. In this module, we'll look at the principles of counterbalance. By that, we mean how the handling and stability of a lift truck is affected by the weight of the load being carried. The principles of counterbalance for an industrial lift truck are not much different than those of a child's teeter-totter. It's all a matter of leverage. When the truck raises its load, it is counterbalanced by the combined weight of the vehicle and a special counterweight located at the rear of the truck. This prevents it from tipping over frontwards. The balance point between the lift truck and its load is called the fulcrum. On a lift truck, this is located under the front wheels. The closer the center of gravity of the load is to the fulcrum, the more the truck is able to lift. By center of gravity, we mean the place at which an object will balance on a single point. This will be located in the middle of the load if it's perfectly square. But notice how it changes depending on the load shape. The load center refers to the distance between the front load carrying face of the forks and the center of gravity of the load. Because of the principle of leverage, the capacity of a lift truck is always expressed in terms of the total weight of the load that can be lifted and its load center. The load center here is 24 inches, or the distance between points A and B. The next concept to be aware of is what is called the stability triangle. There's a very important difference between this lift truck and a car when it comes to suspension. Looking at this forklift from underneath, you can see that it operates on a three-point suspension, two in the fixed front axle and the third at a pivot point at the center of the rear axle. This is quite different from your car that has a more stable four-point suspension. When these three points are joined together, you have what is referred to as the stability triangle. When the center of gravity of the lift truck remains in the stability triangle, the lift truck is most stable. If it moves outside, the truck could tip over. It's as simple as that. And this is absolutely essential to lift truck safety. Each year, almost one half of all lift truck accidents involved the vehicle tipping over because the center of gravity shifted outside of the stability triangle. Notice where the center of gravity is when the forklift is traveling without a load. It's in the middle of the stability triangle. But when the forklift picks up a load, the center of gravity shifts forward in the stability triangle. When the lift truck is loaded to capacity, the center of gravity shifts closer to the edge of the triangle. This increases the risk of tip over during sudden stops. But as long as it stays within the triangle, the lift truck remains stable. Another way in which stability is affected is when centrifugal force enters the picture. The center of gravity within a stability triangle shifts whenever the lift truck makes a turn. If the truck turns to the left, the center of gravity shifts to the right and vice versa. Of course, the faster you turn, the more it shifts. Notice the difference between the center of gravity and the two diagrams. Both trucks are making a left-hand turn. In the forklift that has no load, the center of gravity has moved close to the edge of the triangle. This means that a properly loaded lift truck is actually more stable than an empty one. Statistics show that most rollover accidents happen when a lift truck is moving without a load. Another way in which stability can be affected is by lifting a load and tilting the mast. As the load is raised and the mast tilted, the center of gravity shifts closer to the edge of the stability triangle. But more important, raising the load now makes the whole system much more sensitive to any sideways force like the centrifugal force in a turn. If the load is elevated, the sideways leverage can cause even a small force to tip the truck. The mast should only be tilted back just enough to stabilize the load, and extreme care must be taken to prevent any sudden movements or turns. The next important aspect of counterbalance concerns the load capacity of a lift truck. The load capacity is a maximum weight of material that can be safely raised and moved by the lift truck. 
This takes into account a specific load center raised to a specific height. Remember in the first module we talked about the capacity data plate when checking out the type designation of your lift truck? Well, this is also where you look to find out what the limitations of your vehicle are. You've got to know how to read a capacity data plate. In this box, the weight of the vehicle is identified as approximately 8,130 pounds. Its type is liquefied petroleum gas, and below is the rated capacity. The first line indicates that, with a mast height of 185 inches, the truck can lift a load of 3,750 pounds if the load center is 24 inches. The second line indicates that, with a shorter mast height of 169 inches, the load can be increased to 3,850 pounds if the load center is still 24 inches. And the last line tells the operator that, with a mast height of 151.5 inches, the lifting capacity of the truck is increased to 4,000 pounds, again if the load center remains 24 inches. Always remember, the higher the lift, the lower the capacity. The other factor to consider when determining the capacity of the lift truck is the distance between the front load carrying face of the forks and the center of gravity of the load. As you recall, this distance is referred to as the load center. As the distance between the load carrying face and the center of gravity increases, the load capacity of the forklift decreases. In order to determine the exact capacity of the lift truck in relation to load center, you have to refer to the capacity data chart. To use the chart, First identify the load center number at the very bottom of the scale. Then follow up the line to the thick black line which indicates the upper load curve. Follow the curve over to the left hand side of the chart to read the figure indicating the maximum lifting capacity of the truck. On this chart for instance, if the mast height is 169 inches, the maximum load that can be lifted is 3,200 pounds if the load center is 32 inches. Remember, the farther out the center, the lower the lifting capacity of the truck. Never, under any circumstances, try to lift loads heavier than the capacity of your vehicle. If you do and the truck tips over, the consequences could be fatal. Always keep in mind, the capacity of the lift truck is not how much you can fit on the forks or between the clamps, and it's certainly not the maximum weight the hydraulics can move in a flat-out power lift. The capacity is how much the lift truck is safely designed to handle, depending on weight, load center, and mast height. The principles of counterbalance are some of the most important aspects of lift truck safety you'll ever learn. Find out what the limitations of your vehicle are and respect them. Your safety and that of your co-workers depends on it. So far we've talked about load capacity, how the stability triangle works, and how to find out how much your truck can lift. But there's one more step left to talk about before you're ready to operate a lift truck, and that's the circle check. A circle check is your insurance against the risk of equipment failure. It's a thorough, systematic inspection of a vehicle by the operator for such things as fluid levels, damage, and signs of wear and tear. It's only done by you, the operator, and it's done at the start of every shift. And while you're doing a circle check, you have to document the inspection with an operator's daily checklist. Remember, as an operator, you're the one who's ultimately responsible for knowing whether or not your vehicle's safe to drive. And the only way you're going to know that for sure is to check it out before every shift. That way you'll be able to spot any potential problems before they can cause a serious accident. So let's take a look now at exactly how to perform a good circle check. Begin by getting yourself a copy of the operator's daily checklist. 
This ensures that nothing is left off during the inspection. And it can also be very helpful to your maintenance department if the vehicle has to go into the shop for repairs. Always start your inspection at the fuel source. Check the condition of the cylinder and the way it's installed. Be sure the pressure relief valve is pointing upwards. This way it functions properly and the fuel gauge will also be more accurate. Be sure the straps holding the cylinder are in good shape and the clamps are secure. Check the connections to see they're snug. Then turn the cylinder valve on and check for signs of leakage. If there is a leak, you may hear a hissing sound or see fog appearing, but you will definitely smell a rotten egg odor. If you do, stop your inspection, turn off the cylinder valve, and notify your supervisor immediately. If the fuel source is okay, walk around the vehicle. Keep your eyes open for any signs of new damage to the lift truck. As you walk around the lift truck, inspect the tires for tread wear or damage. They should be free of cuts, gouges, or deep cracks. And all the lug nuts should be securely in place. Be on the lookout for any drips or puddles of brake or transmission fluid, engine coolant, or hydraulic oil on the floor. A leak may mean a loose or defective fitting, a leaky cylinder, or a punctured hose. Be sure to include all hoses, cylinders, and connections during your inspection. When you're looking at the mast and carriage assembly, check the alignment to see that it isn't crooked. Inspect the condition of the lift chains and pull on each one to check for equal tension. And be sure the backrest is in good condition and the mast channels are clear. As you look over the forks, keep an eye open for hairline cracks or metal burrs at the tip that could snag and damage materials. The forks should be evenly aligned and not twisted or bent. And they must be properly secured in place. The condition and angle of the heels also needs to be checked. Heel angle should not exceed 90 degrees. As you pass by the fire extinguisher, look to see that it's fully charged. At the engine compartment, check each fluid level. Look over the condition of the belts and determine if the tension is set tight enough. Inspect the condition of the air filter and ensure it isn't clogged with dirt. The engine will run more efficiently and the level of exhaust contaminants will be much lower when the air filter is clean. And check the condition of the battery and the connections. One last thing before you climb on board. Observe the condition of the overhead guard. Is it free from cracks or other damage? And is it tightly secured to the body of the truck? Now you're ready to turn your attention to the operator's compartment. Be sure the seat is in good condition and the seat belt works. As you're sitting in the seat, the manufacturer's capacity data plate should be plainly visible. If it's covered with dirt or grease, clean it off. Next, turn the engine on and listen carefully for any unusual noises. Each indicating gauge should be working properly. And don't forget to sound the horn and turn on the lights. Feel for any unusual play or heaviness in the brake pedal or excess play in the steering wheel. Test the hydraulic controls to ensure that the lift and tilt functions are working smoothly. Now, with the parking brake engaged, put the forklift in gear and slowly press down on the accelerator. If the brake is working properly, the forklift shouldn't move. The final brake test is done with the vehicle in motion. If you're satisfied with the condition of the truck, it's ready to use. If you're not, Report any defects or damage to the maintenance department and have the vehicle taken out of service until it's fixed. If for any reason you can't get the truck to the garage, tag out the controls so that everybody else knows the vehicle is unsafe. The circle check is about being a professional and taking responsibility. When a vehicle is parked, the company, your supervisor, your maintenance department are responsible for it. But once you sit in that seat, a lot of the responsibility shifts to you. 
If you're smart, you'll start every shift with a careful circle check first. In this industry, lift trucks handle millions of tons of material every year. So the opportunities for accidents to happen when safety rules are ignored are enormous. A lot depends on operators to get the job done without damaging material or equipment. But the real mark of a competent operator is the one who gets the job done safely without getting hurt or injuring anyone else. There's really no big secret to becoming a good operator. It's a matter of having the knowledge and skills you need to do the job safely, and then using what you know to keep you safe. Let me show you what I mean. At intersections and blind spots, the traffic can get hectic. Lift trucks are coming from every direction, and then there's a pedestrians walking by. Put yourself behind the wheel and think about it. Half the time, you're looking through the mast and carriage assembly to see where you're going. The other half, you're looking back over your shoulder. One second, the coast is clear, and the next thing you know, someone is in your path. Sound familiar? It happens all the time. How fast you react could make the difference between someone getting hurt and an accident being avoided. When it comes to lift truck safety, pedestrians are your number one concern. If you do spot someone, sound your horn. Be sure to make eye contact and signal the person when it's safe to move. And likewise, if you're on foot, keep a close eye open for vehicle traffic. Respect the fact that lift truck operators are at a disadvantage when it comes to seeing you first. When you approach an intersection or blind spot, drive slowly and sound your horn. And always be on the lookout for pedestrians. Let your guard down for a minute, and the possible results could be fatal. The same rules of the road apply when you're operating close to other lift trucks. Heavy traffic areas, like shipping and receiving docks, for example, can really force an operator to be on his toes. Loaded trucks are coming in, and empty ones are leaving all the time. Fixed convex mirrors at overhead blind spots are an added safety feature to help operators and pedestrians avoid each other. Keeping an eye on them as you approach a blind spot or intersection helps to spot oncoming traffic or pedestrians before you make direct visual contact. As a lift truck operator, you're always required to maneuver in and around tight situations, such as narrow aisleways. Again, Slow down and learn to judge the correct aisle width for your truck and the load you're carrying. Remember, the rear wheels are doing the steering. That means when the front of the lift truck turns one way, the rear end will swing out in the opposite direction. Turn too sharply and you could easily sideswipe something or someone next to you. Ramps and inclines are another area in a plant or mill that demand safe operating habits. Traveling in reverse with a load is usually a safe practice, but not when it comes to traveling up a ramp. Instead, drive forward with a load on the uphill side. This helps to stabilize the vehicle. If this lift truck was to back up with a load on the downhill side, the uneven weight distribution would increase the risk of the load sliding off or the lift truck tipping over. When descending a ramp with a load, always travel backwards. This increases the stability of the vehicle and avoids the possibility of the load falling off. If the lift truck is empty and you have to travel up a ramp, the safest practice is to drive in reverse. It gives the driver better visibility and the counterweight becomes the load, making the vehicle more stable. And don't forget to sound the horn as you approach the top of the ramp to warn others of your presence. One other thing worth mentioning. If you can't see where you're going because of the load, 
get a signaler. It's not only the safest way to get the job done, it's a requirement under the regulations. Loading and offloading transport trucks can be an ongoing, around-the-clock activity at many pulp and paper operations. Because of the dangers of maneuvering in a tight area, traffic congestion, and the risk of trailer creep, it's not surprising that many serious accidents happen here. In order to prevent accidents from happening in these areas, transport drivers and the lift truck operators together must ensure trailers are properly secured. Before any loading or offloading is done, there are a few simple but critical steps to follow. The trailer must first be positioned as close as possible to the loading dock. More and more transport trailers are now equipped with air spring units located on the rear axles. Drivers must ensure this system is bled before anyone is allowed to enter the trailer. If it isn't, the trailer will bounce as lift trucks enter and exit. This could cause the trailer to shift as much as six inches from the dock and create a serious safety hazard. The docking plate could fall out of place or a lift truck tire could get snagged in the gap. Once the air springs are bled, the trailer will come down to rest at its lowest point on the axle. The trailer will now have to be nudged as close as possible to the dock. The parking brakes are then set before the driver leaves the tractor. The tires must now be secured with a minimum of two wheel chocks, one at the front of each outside rear tire. If the tractor is detached from the trailer, it should be supported with both the landing gear and an additional jack. In order to guarantee that the trailer is safe to enter, it's a responsibility of lift truck operators to double check that all precautions have been taken. This includes a quick inspection of the trailer's undercarriage for any damage. If conditions are safe, the air brake should then be locked out by applying a lock to the glad hand connection of the airline. This type of lockout procedure is an added safety feature to prevent any miscommunication between transport driver and lift truck operator when it concerns moving the trailer. Once these precautions have been taken, the dock restraint should be engaged to the rear frame of the trailer. Together with the wheel chocks, this helps prevent the trailer from shifting as the lift truck enters and exits. The final step is to secure the docking plate firmly in place and begin loading or offloading materials. As heavy loads are moved in and out of transport trucks, care must be taken to avoid product damage. When backing out of the trailer, face the direction of travel and watch out for other vehicles and pedestrians. Load handling affects both quality and safety. Clamping a paper roll, for instance, requires a certain technique in order to avoid making the load unstable or damaging the product. The correct way to clamp a roll is through its horizontal and vertical center lines with the contact pads and not the arms. Clamping ahead or behind the center line may result in a load that is unstable, damage to the paper rolls, or excess stress in the rotating components of the arm. If the roll is picked up from the bilge position, ensure that the clamps are evenly centered on the roll before exerting clamp pressure. A paper roll can either be picked up from the vertical position or from the horizontal or bilge position. Regardless of which position it's picked up from, it must be transported in the vertical position. This avoids stress on the short clamp arm and stabilizes the load. Once the roll is picked up, drive the lift truck in reverse facing the direction of travel. Vertical loading or unloading from high stacks places extra demands on operators. Attention to safety is critical in these situations. The higher the load is lifted, the more unstable the vehicle becomes. Any sudden movements could topple the lift truck on its side with disastrous consequences. Operators must also be aware of ceiling heights and the clearance above the top of the stack. 
hitting the ceiling could seriously affect the stability of the load at such a height. These are some of the typical situations that require safe operating habits day in and day out in order to avoid lift truck accidents. There are by no means all of the situations you may encounter because each plant or mill has its own unique set of hazards. It's your job to know those hazards and develop safe habits to prevent accidents. How you operate your vehicle makes a difference whether or not someone gets hurt or equipment or materials are damaged. Again, it all comes down to the fact that lift truck safety is more than a matter of looking out for hazards. Lift truck safety is a matter of how you perform every operation, how you do every lift, and how you make every trip. It's all the time, and it's every time. It's good, safe operating habits that get you home to your family at the end of the day in one piece. Think about it. Does anything really matter more? Lift trucks come in many different sizes and shapes and can either be powered electrically, by diesel, gasoline, or propane. The type of power supply will determine where in the mill your lift truck is safe to use. In this section, we're going to look at one particular type of power supply, liquefied petroleum gas, the most common being propane. And we'll examine some important safety hazards you must be aware of whenever handling propane. The majority of lift trucks used in the pulp and paper industry today are powered by propane. Propane is proving to be an inexpensive fuel source that produces cleaner exhaust emissions than similar engines using gasoline or diesel fuel. It's economical and easy to use, but propane can also be very dangerous because it's highly flammable. A propane leak in contact with a spark or open flame could set off a fire with devastating consequences. This explosive fuel source must always be treated with utmost respect. Propane comes stored in pressurized cylinders. Inside the cylinder, most of the gas is stored in liquid form, with some amount being vapor. As propane is released, it converts to an extremely cold vapor due to its low boiling point. Exposure to this cold vapor can easily cause eye damage and severe frostbite. That's why propane cylinders should never be handled without wearing safety glasses, goggles or face shields, and thick leather gloves. If you've ever worked around propane, you've noticed from time to time a rotten egg odor. This unpleasant odor associated with propane is actually ethyl mercaptan, or stench gas. It's a built-in safety feature to warn you that propane has leaked out of a cylinder into the surrounding air. Once propane escapes into the air, one cubic foot of this gas will expand 270 times. That's why there's no such thing as a small propane leak. And because it's heavier than air, it collects at low points and will travel along the floor of the building. If the concentration is high enough and it finds a source of ignition, you'll have a violent explosion and fire in your plant. Don't take any chances with propane leaks. Treat them all as a potential emergency. As an operator, one of the procedures you have to know is how to safely change a propane cylinder on your lift truck. First, lower the forks to the floor if you're driving a forklift and engage the parking brake. Before you do anything else, make sure you're wearing your personal protective equipment. Now, with the engine running, turn off the valve on the propane cylinder and let the truck stall out. This bleeds the feeder line to the engine and prevents overspray when the line is disconnected from the cylinder. Disconnect the feeder line from the cylinder and set it aside. Unhook the retaining straps and remove the empty cylinder. Then move the empty cylinder to the storage area and retrieve a full one. When installing a full cylinder, be sure the pressure relief valve is pointing up and the guide hole is down. 
In this position, the pressure relief valve functions properly and the fuel gauge will give accurate readings. Reconnect a feeder line to the engine and slowly turn the cylinder valve on. Another thing to keep in mind is the O-ring found inside the neck of the cylinder where the feeder line connects. As the cylinder valve is being turned on, this O-ring occasionally fails and overspray may occur. If this happens, turn the valve off immediately and replace a defective cylinder. Propane can be a safe source of fuel for lift trucks if we take the proper precautions and respect the fact that it can be dangerous. Remember to always wear personal protective equipment when handling cylinders, treat all propane leaks as potential emergencies, and keep open flames and lit cigarettes far away from fuel sources. Follow these precautions and your mill will be a safe place to work. Batteries are an extremely efficient and clean method of providing electrical energy to lift trucks. But like all energy sources, batteries can cause damage or injury if they're improperly handled. In order to prevent that from happening, there are some specific practices that must be followed whenever handling batteries or hooking them up to chargers. And there are also some practices that are important to remember in order to extend the life of the battery and ensure that they're working properly. But before looking at these practices, let's begin by examining exactly how a typical battery cell works. Basically, each cell consists of a positive plate and a negative plate immersed in a solution of sulfuric acid and water. This solution is called electrolyte. At the top of the battery is a vent cap designed to allow hydrogen gas to escape during the charging process. Each cell produces approximately two volts of power. As electric current is drawn out to provide power, a chemical reaction takes place within each cell. Eventually, the energy producing potential of the battery is depleted and recharging is necessary. To replenish the battery, the terminals are connected to a battery charger for several hours. During this time, the charger reverses the chemical reaction inside each battery cell and eventually restores their potential to provide power on demand. This enables the battery to be used again to power the lift truck. The proper procedure to follow whenever charging a battery begins with proper personal protective equipment. Rubber gloves and eye protection are necessary to avoid injury from battery hazards. Next, be sure the charger is off. Check connectors and cables for damage then connect the battery to the charger and turn the unit on. When the battery is fully charged, turn the charger off before disconnecting the plug. Avoid overcharging the battery. This will slowly damage the cells and can reduce the life of the battery. No amount of overcharging will increase battery output beyond its rated capacity. Whenever electrolyte levels in the battery are checked, Additional personal protective equipment is necessary. An apron to protect yourself from battery acid should be worn, as well as a full face shield. Begin by removing the cell caps and check each cell level. Add distilled water if any of the cells are low. A battery with low water levels will lose its charge faster and ultimately have to be replaced sooner. Add water if necessary only after the charging process is complete. If added ahead of time, the water level may bubble up and overflow onto the top of the battery as the charging process is taking place. If spills do occur, neutralize them immediately with a solution of water and baking soda. Acid spills can damage the outside of the battery, and if it touches the skin, can cause painful burns. If skin or eye contact does occur, rinse thoroughly with water for at least 15 minutes and seek medical attention. Every plant or mill should provide eye wash stations, especially in close proximity to battery chargers in case that happens. 
Hydrometer reading should be taken regularly to test the efficiency of the battery cells. It's much the same as a doctor taking your blood pressure. The hydrometer reads the specific gravity of the acid water solution and indicates if the electrical system in the battery is balanced. There's one more important safety precaution that needs to be talked about when it comes to batteries, and that's proper ventilation. As batteries charge, the chemical reaction going on in the electrolyte creates a mixture of oxygen and explosive hydrogen gas. If the buildup of hydrogen exceeds 4% and a spark or lit cigarette is introduced, you've got yourself a life-threatening situation. That's why all battery charging areas must be properly ventilated. And that's why cutting, burning, or cigarette smoking at any time must never be permitted in or around charging areas. That's not only common sense, that's the law. Play it safe. Whenever you're handling batteries, wear personal protective equipment, follow the correct charging procedures, and follow the guidelines for maintaining the life of the battery. This helps guarantee that your lift truck will have a clean and efficient power source without causing damage or injury to yourself or to anyone else.